I've been using a Mac for software development for well over 15 years now. And in that time, I've really refined the set of applications that I use day to day to make my software development life easier, to make my writing life easier. And in today's video, we're gonna run through those applications. I've got 15 or so to discuss. So let's dive straight in. So the first piece of software I wanna talk about is Emacs. Now Emacs is not a Mac specific app. It works pretty much everywhere. I use it on my Linux machines as well. And at first glance, it might look like it's just a code editor for programmers. And I do use it for my programming work, but it's much more than that. It, it's kind of like a great system for working with textual content of any kind. So I do all of my writing in Emacs as well. Like I write the scripts and the outlines for these videos. I write my website content in Emacs. I write kind of memos and stuff for work. I also ingest textual content. So things like my RSS feeds come into my Emacs system and I read them there. I got burned by the whole Google Reader thing. I had a great list of RSS feeds that I was reading and then Google shut that down, which was agony. So more now I focus on keeping that precious data in systems that I control and Emacs is great for that. For me, the killer use case for Emacs is something called Org Mode, which is kind of like a productivity system on steroids. I use it for scheduling, to-do list, calendar, planning, all those kind of things, but also I use it as my personal knowledge management system. Now you might use an app like Notion or Roam for this, and those are fine apps and they have great user interfaces, but the issue is to a more or less degree, your data is coupled to those systems and your kind of your workflow is coupled to those systems. With org mode, I own the data. It's just plain text files that sit on my computer and I own the ability to interact with them because I have this open source free tool that I can use. It's really powerful. Like even though the files are just based on plain text, you can do things like I have a simple Kanban board set up for my videos. So I've, I've set like videos go through a bunch of different stages and I can move them through the stages and then org mode renders a little Kanban board for me. So even though it is only plain text, you don't have to give up on the rich features you'd get from something like Notion or from Rome. If you work with text in any way, I really do think that Emacs is worth investing some time with. The biggest issue is it's quite a steep learning curve. I've been using it for like, I don't know, 15 years now, and I still <laughs> discover new things every day. What I recommend for newbies is that you try out something called Doom Emacs, which is kind of like an Emacs configuration that's been curated by the community and has like a bunch of sensible defaults. I used to manage my own Emacs config and it's a painstaking process. These days I just use Doom, it's much, much easier. So next up we have Firefox. I know all the cool kids are probably using Chrome these days, but I just really hold out hope that we won't end up with a Chrome only web. So I stick to using Firefox. There are a few actual functional reasons though. Like I really like a couple of the plugins that come with Firefox. So particularly I like this multi-account containers plugin. You can maintain different profiles, different identities all within one uh, Firefox instance. So I have like a profile for my work, a profile for shopping, a profile for my banking. And the nice thing there is that the tracking is isolated. So like the shopping one, I'm tracked all around the internet of all the things I buy. But then when I go to my banking, they're not linked and I can kind of create these distinct identities. It's a really powerful system. Another plugin I really like is called Org Capture. This allows me to send a link straight to Org Mode in Emacs and record that in my knowledge management system. So as I'm browsing the internet, I'm seeing an article I want to read and I just capture it into Emacs. If you ever use something like Pocket, like it's kind of that, but again, you own all the data and it all sits in your own private system. For me, the killer extension from Firefox is something called Tridactyl, which brings the key bindings from a text editor called Vim into the browser, making it far more practical to navigate the entire internet just using the keyboard so you don't have to use the mouse. And I also use these same key bindings in Emacs. This is kind of the standard thing in Doom Emacs. So the same key bindings to kind of like move up and down the page and move backwards and forwards in the history are all there within the uh, browser and with the text editor. One of the really nice things about Tridactyl is you can press the F key to bring up the kind of hinting mode and then all the links and all of the kind of form fields are given these little mnemonics and I can key one in and navigate to that link or go to that form field. I definitely don't have to use the mouse for pretty much all the browsing I do. And this just helps if you have RSI or if you like work on a cramped system, like a little laptop, much easier to use just the keyboard. So next up we have Kitty, which is a terminal emulator for Mac. I spend a ton of my time working in the terminal, both as a software engineer, but also just for kind of hobbies and things like that. And it's important for me to have a good, fast terminal. And Kitty is notably faster than the built-in macOS terminal. The other nice thing about Kitty is it works on Mac and Linux. So I can use the exact same terminal emulator on my Mac and on my Linux machines. Another really important thing I like about Kitty is that out of the box, the default configuration is far more sensible and works with far more things than say the Mac OS one. For example, I recently did a video on Midnight Commander, which is a great terminal application for file management. And the key bindings on that just don't work out of the box on Mac OS Terminal. You kind of have to do all this esoteric configuration 
and pretty much straight away, everything works on Kitty. You need one line of config and everything works. And the final reason why I really like Kitty is it just looks really slick. If you configure your favorite theme, I like the Dracula theme. Once you configure that, the window all blends in, the title bar is all the same color. It just looks really sharp. And if you spend a lot of time looking at the same application, I think it's really important that it looks nice. So sticking with the open source theme, one of my favorite pieces of software of all time is SyncThing. This is a peer-to-peer -peer file syncing tool. And I've completely replaced iCloud, Dropbox, all those kind of things for file syncing with SyncThing. It runs pretty much everywhere. In fact, the only place that I need it to run that doesn't run natively is iOS, but it does run on Android. And you simply configure which folders from which machines you want to go to which other machines. And you have complete control over the topology. It's really powerful. So for example, I have a single folder where all my org mode content is stored. And I just sync that to all machines. I also sync it to my NAS and sync thing runs on my NAS as well. And then from there, the folder is backed up to the cloud. So it's a really elegant workflow. But I don't have to sync to all machines, which is really important. So I have one folder that I only sync between my editing laptop and my NAS. And this contains kind of all like reference footage and, you know, like overlays and things I use in these videos that I don't want on my work machine or on my Raspberry Pi or something that doesn't have a lot of disk space. And because sync thing is peer to peer, you have this fine grained control over where your files go. A really powerful feature of sync thing is it has this notion of a built in public relay. So when you leave your house, you don't have to open a port or set up a VPN or anything like that to get access to machines that are back at home. You can still sync through these public relays, one of which is provided for free by the SyncThing team. And you can always host your own if you're a bit more security conscious, which is a project that I have on my to-do list. I have a tutorial coming up on SyncThing, so make sure you're subscribed if that's the kind of thing you want to see in the future. Left unattended, my desktop environment on the Mac just gets completely chaotic. Windows everywhere, desktops everywhere. So I use an app called Amethyst to bring some order to this chaos. With Amethyst, it lays out your windows algorithmically into tiles. It's a tiling window manager. And you can construct different layouts of your to your preference and then just cycle through them when you're, when you're working. So maybe you want a text editor and a browser side by side, a configuration I often use when I'm working on my laptop. On a bigger monitor, I like to have a similar layout, the text editor in the middle and two windows off to the side. Another thing that you can do by default in Amethyst. What's really nice about Amethyst though is that you can do most of your common window navigation and manipulation all from the keyboard. So staying with this theme for me, which is really important of being able to try to navigate and operate as much as possible without the mouse. So I can you know, change which window is where on the screen. I can move windows to new spaces. I can change the focus between windows all from the keyboard. I do have a full tutorial video on Amethyst that you can see, which is linked above if you want to learn a bit more. So next up we have Hammerspoon, an amazing automation tool for Mac OS that for me radically simplifies how I interact with the computer on a daily basis. The simplest thing you can do with Hammerspoon is a kind of a keyboard shortcut. So I've got a shortcut that does a command shift enter, opens up a kitty window, really, really simple. You can create more complex kind of modal keyboard shortcuts. What I mean by that is if I press command shift and E, I enter into my Emacs modal. Following that with an, another E opens up Emacs directly, following it with an N opens up an org mode note capture with a T opens up a to do capture, so on. You get the idea. You can create as many of these shortcuts as you want. And I've got a bunch of them created for the most common tasks that I do every day. Hammerspoon isn't just limited to creating keyboard shortcuts though. It's powered by a programming language called Lua. So you can create whole scripts, whole, whole programs really to run as part of your automations. One of the things you can do is create menu bar items, some of which actually come out of the box. So I have this really cool mic mute widget here, which will globally mute the mic. I can also bind this to a keyboard shortcut. So either pressing my shortcut or triggering it from the menu will just globally mute my mic. Another such widget I have is just a bulk eject. I can trigger eject all of the SD cards or USB drives I've got here. And because Hammerspoon can also listen to system events, I can configure this eject widget to also eject when I close the lid. Really, really powerful. So next up is an application called Homebrew, which is a package manager for Mac, which means you use Homebrew to install other pieces of software, other packages. I do have a full video going through Homebrew, which you can see over here, but very briefly, the thing that's great about Homebrew is when you're installing things like SyncThing or Firefox or Kitty or Hammerspoon, you don't need to go to the individual website and figure out what the particular installation instructions are. You can just ask Homebrew to install it for you. So brew, install Hammerspoon, installs Hammerspoon, brew, install Kitty, installs Kitty. It's a really powerful system, especially if you use a lot of free and open source tools. So moving on from the free and open source tools to commercial tools, I want to start with Meter, one of my favorite apps. I use it multiple times a day and all it does 
is sit in your menu bar and tell you when your next meeting is. Then if you click on the icon, it launches that meeting, opening the correct video conferencing software. So if it's a Hangout, it opens Hangouts. If it's a Zoom, it opens Zoom. A really nice feature of Meter is that you can bind a keyboard shortcut to this launch next meeting action. So I've bound the print screen button to launch next meeting. And whenever I've got a meeting, I just press print screen and I'm immediately into Hangouts or Zoom or whatever meeting software it is that's required for that meeting. Next up, we have Setup, which is, I like to think of it as like a subscription library or something like that. Like I pay a monthly fee and I get access to a bunch of applications. And I didn't think I'd like this at first because in general, I'm not really a fan of like paying a subscription for something. Like I won't pay if I could possibly avoid it for Adobe Creative Cloud. And we'll get to that. But I really ended up liking Setup because you just get so many applications in there that I really like to use. Meter being one of them. So I could pay for Meter and get a license for it, but I can also get access to it as part of my setup subscription. In fact, I ended up liking setup so much, I've got two subscriptions. I got the one that my work gave me, but I ended up buying a personal subscription as well because I wanted to use it on all my personal machines. It's worth trying out if you're interested in like experimenting with a whole bunch of apps and getting access to a powerful suite of tools, give setup a go. So next up, we have a piece of software that I use nearly as much as Emacs, which is DaVinci Resolve, a video editing software that I use to edit all of the videos for this channel. There is a free version of DaVinci, which I used for many, many months when I first started the channel, and it's absolutely fine. I recently picked up a studio license. I bought the Blackmagic Speed Editor keyboard for Resolve, and it came with a free license for studio. And the extras are great, but you don't need them if you want to build videos. A lot of people always ask, like, what tools do you use to do the channel and so forth? And people want to talk about Premiere or Final Cut. Those are fine tools. I really do recommend DaVinci Resolve. And I also don't think that the reputation it has for being hard to learn is at all true. I found it much easier to learn than Premiere, much easier to learn than Final Cut Pro. I don't know if that's because it kind of fits my mental model as a computer programmer, it kind of made sense to me, um, but it's free. You can try it without having to pay any money. So give it a go. It's a great editing software. So next up we have Affinity Photo, which if you clicked on the thumbnail to get into this video, you will have seen the output from Affinity Photo. I've been using Affinity on the iPad for years now, and I recently started using the Mac version in place of Photoshop, and I think I'm going to completely replace Photoshop with Affinity and all my workflows. For me, at least, there's nothing I can do in Photoshop that I can also do in Affinity Photo, and I'm familiar enough now with the kinds of things that I want to do that I'm able to port them from Photoshop to Affinity, because I think that is the biggest weakness of Affinity versus Photoshop, is that you can go onto YouTube and get millions of tutorials about Photoshop, not so for Affinity. So you kind of have to be reasonably well-versed with Photoshop first, I think, to be able to be really good at Affinity. But if you are a capable image editor already, Affinity is great. And if you're sick of paying the Adobe tax, I do recommend it. Next up, we have one password. You have to have a password manager. You shouldn't be kind of like using a single password for every website or trying to write your passwords down on a piece of paper or memorize them. Make sure you have a password manager. I've been using one password since it first came out, which I think was like 2007. And nowadays it works everywhere, Windows, Linux, Android, Mac. So it's kind of just pervaded my life. I have a family account with them. So my wife uses it, my daughter uses it. It's all encompassing for us. If you're looking for a password manager and you kind of want something that's very easy, something that's gonna be uh, simple to use, I do think 1Password is that solution. So I'm not really the kind of person who buys into kind of productivity, life hacks and things like that. But the one thing that I do use day in, day out, that really works for me is the Pomodoro technique. And the whole idea is that you break your work down into 25 minute tranches. You take a five minute break after each tranche. And after you've done four such tranches, maybe you take a longer break of say 30 minutes. And I find that one or two tranches is enough to kind of get me going. If I'm stuck in the morning, I'll start a Pomodoro, maybe do a second one, at worst do a third one, but then I'm into the flow. And to make this work really well on the Mac, I use an app called Flow. At the core, Flow is just a digital timer that understands this Pomodoro structure. And it shows up in the menu bar and shows you how long you've got in your current iteration, in your current session. And then when you, it comes to break time, it shows you how long you've got for your break and it sends you notifications and all those kind of things. It's a really useful thing to just have ticking along in the background. One of the powerful things it can do is block certain applications. For me, Slack is the ultimate productivity drain. So I have Flow configured to just completely block Slack whenever I'm in one of those 25 minute Pomodoro tranches. Flow will also block website access, but it doesn't block it inside Firefox, which is so frustrating because I don't want to have to switch to Chrome just for this feature. I really hope they do add Firefox 
support in the future. But if you're using Chrome or Safari, then you are well away. Next up is an app that I never thought I needed, and it's CleanShot X. With CleanShot, you can create great screenshots, you can create great screen recordings, but both of those features are built into Mac. So you might wonder, well, why have you got another app for that? And I think it's just the workflow around how CleanShot works. So for example, when you're taking screenshots, you can configure it to auto hide all the desktop icons, which if you are a desktop clutterer like me, it's very useful. You can also configure it to auto hide the shadow or make the desktop transparent, all kinds of different parameters. And all that happens is it, it makes that change while taking the screenshot and then puts your desktop back to normal, which I take a lot of screenshots for the channel. Uh, you'll sometimes see them kind of like panning in and panning out on the video. If I had to declutter my desktop every time, turn the shadows off and so forth, it'd be really onerous. So CleanShot makes that much smoother. It also creates great video recordings. It has the ability to capture the webcam, the microphone. It will record your mouse, mouse clicks. It'll record your keyboard presses. It's a really nice way of creating like rich, powerful screencasts. Carrying on with this theme of apps I didn't think I needed is better display. Now, I don't always work with an external monitor plugged in, but when I do, I find the interface in Mac OS just completely confusing and baffling. And better display just fixes this. It's a little menu bar icon that shows you all the displays you've got plugged in. If your display supports resolution changes, you can change the resolution from here. Some displays, like I've got the LG 5K Ultra Fine, you can change the brightness directly inside better display. And you can also kind of switch on and off mirroring. So if you want to mirror or not, then you can control that. Another nice feature in better display, if you create a lot of screencasts, is the ability to create dummy displays. You might have noticed if you tried to record the screen on your MacBook or something like that, that the resolution isn't 16 by nine. So it doesn't work well when you put it on YouTube or something like that. With better display, you can create a dummy 16 by nine display, mirror your desktop to it. And then when you record your screen, it's going to record in 16 by nine resolution. I use that trick all the time to record the screencast that you see in the channel. And it saves me from having to sit plugged into a monitor to do that. I can do it on my kitchen counter or whatever. Really powerful. Next up for all you data junkies is iStats menu. I have to have this. I don't know why. I don't even use it often, but I just have to be able to look and see like how much memory am I using? How much disk space am I using? How hot is my CPU core? I'll check it like once or twice a day, which is not even that much, but it's really nice to just have it. Whenever you're diagnosing a performance problem or you think your computer's dying, being able to jump into the extremely voluminous amounts of data you get from iStats is really powerful. This again just appears in the menu bar. You can completely configure what stats you want to show. You know, maybe you just want basic CPU stats. Maybe you want the weather or maybe you want other complex things. All these are available in iStats menu. Such a great app. And then last but absolutely not least is the essential bartender. If you run things like Meter and iStats Menu and Better Display and Flow, you'll very, very quickly end up with a menu bar that is full of clutter. And Bartender just completely takes care of that. In the simplest use case, you can just hide everything and just have the Bartender icon show. And when you click on that, it kind of pops up all the menu bar icons. Where I think Bartender gets really powerful is that you can conditionally show these menu bar icons. They don't have to always hide them. So one thing you can do is just show an icon when its state changes. So I have the little icon for the mic mute widget from Hammerspoon configured to show when the state changes. So if I press the keyboard shortcut, the icon shows for a few seconds then disappears. And if I press it again, it kind of comes back up again. You can also configure Bartender to show the icon when it doesn't match a certain state. So I have the flow icon configured to show when it doesn't show the default 25 minutes timer. So that means it will show when a Pomodoro is running and hide when it's not. This just keeps the bar clean but means I don't always have to press on the little bartender icon to see things that are relevant to my current context. It's a really powerful piece of software, definitely worth getting. It's also part of setup if you manage to get hold of that as well. So there we go. Those are my favorite apps to install on the Mac. I really hope that you found an app that was useful to you or interesting to you. If you think I missed an app that I should be using, that you're using, please do put that in the comments below. And otherwise, I hope you found the video useful and entertaining. And if so, please hit like, please hit subscribe, maybe hit the bell as well so you don't miss out on any future content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.